Physics Notes, Unit 16, Part B. So we're on waves and oscillations, specifically now talking about simple harmonic motion, which is a little bit more general than just waves, because this applies to systems that are repetitive. They have a repetitive pattern, a regular repetitive back and forth motion, or cyclical motion, that is a period and a frequency that we just calculated. In particular, we'll be talking about a mass on a spring and a simple pendulum here, which are two very, pretty much the only good examples, well, the only examples we'll use for simple harmonic motion. These are all some kind of things to keep in mind. They're kind of generic, but very important. The restoring force is proportional to the displacement. In other words, we, like down here, we're gonna, we will have a mass on a spring, and, and a, this spring is on a table, and the spring can be stretched or compressed. But this spot right here where the, the zero is, that's where this, like if you took this mass off of the spring, that's how long a spring is. These two uh, lighter colored masses here are just showing you where the mass is going to vibrate. Like if I pull this back over here to this location with amplitude A and let it go, it will, it will bounce back and forth. So this, you stretch the spring, but then it has a restoring force. It wants to pull back. That's what we talk about by restoring force. The more you pull it, the, the more you stretch the spring, the more the force wants to pull back because it's proportional. The more you stretch, the bigger the restoring force. Same thing for a pendulum. When you pull a pendulum back further, there's more of a restoring force that wants to bring it back down to the bottom because now you make it higher. The higher you make it, the more it wants to go back to the bottom spot, the equilibrium spot. That's another name for this spot right here, equilibrium. If you just put it there, that mass will stay there. If you stretch it, it'll go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And if there's no friction, it'll go back and forth forever. Same thing with a pendulum. It'll swing back and forth forever if there's no friction. Now, the force, acceleration, and velocity are not uniform. All right, These are not uniform velocity problems. It's speeding up and slowing down. And it's not even speeding up and slowing down at a standard set acceleration. The acceleration is uh, big at the two extremes. The velocity is small at the two extremes. You don't need to remember that. All you got to know is that the force is not... Is not um, uniform, the force increases with displacement. The acceleration is not one set acceleration. We're not really going to measure the acceleration for these. You could, but we are not going to measure the acceleration. But it, all you need to know is that the force, acceleration, and velocity are not uniform. If you were to graph this motion, it comes out to be like a sine wave, and that's the connection to waves. The mathematical representation would be a, the sine wave with amplitude and period and frequency, all the same terminology. So the good examples here are mass on a spring and simple pendulum. Now we did talk about this a little bit in a previous class, if you took Physics 201, but we have this thing right here which is called Hooke's Law, H-O-O-K-E-S, Hooke's Law, where the force, like, like the force to stretch this spring is equal to negative K, which is the stiffness of the spring, times how far you stretch it. In other words, if you double the stretch, if you make x twice as big, you need to use twice the force, or conversely, the spring pulls back on you with twice the force. That also lines up with Newton's third law of motion. All right, if you pull on the spring, the spring pulls on you. If this mass pulls the spring outward with a force, it requires a force to pull it out. Now, a lot of, a lot of time, or half the time, with springs, you also have a vertical spring where it bounces up and down. Where the applied force is gravity pulling the weight down, and you let it bounce up and down, up and down, up and down, uh, and we, it would be the same math for that as it is for side to side, side to side, side to side. Okay, when you stretch a spring, you have energy, potential energy. Potential energy in a spring is one half k times x squared. Once again, k is how stiff the spring is. If you have a really, really stiff spring, k is a really big number. It's measured in newtons per meter. All right, and I believe you did a lab on that in Physics 201, if you took Physics 201 or any previous physics class. If not, it doesn't really matter if you did that lab or not. Because we're not going to really be using this equation right now. But what we're going to be using is this equation right here. This equation right here, which has period. The period of a mass on a spring. The time it takes to bounce back and forth one time. So from, from say, this spot right here, I, I pull it out. And right here, I let it go. It'll bounce over to here same negative amplitude, and then back to that original spot. So how long does it take to get over there and back? That's the time. That's the period. And the frequency will be one over that. 
and we'll practice that in a few minutes. But the period of time it takes to go for, uh, up through one cycle is equal to 2 pi times the square root of the mass that's on there divided by the spring constant. All right, so we're going to practice that and practice that in a little bit here. Um, what doesn't really, it, here's one thing, you might want to jot this down. And like I say, these can bounce up and down too. I have, I have that jotted down up here at the top. But, but here's the thing, it doesn't really matter how far you pull it. You can pull it a little bit further and the period will be the same. That's the implication of this, this equation. The mass, you put a bigger mass on here, you're going to have a different period. If you pull it back to this spot, same spot with a different mass, you'll get a different answer for the period. Or you put a different spring on there, you get a different period. But if you pull it a little farther than A, like a little A plus a little bit, and let it go, because that increases the force, it just travels a little faster and it goes a little bit further, but it takes the same amount of time. So that's something to write down and to think about. The period depends on the mass and the spring constant, not how far you pull it, not the amplitude of oscillation, which would be con which would be related to the energy in a system. If you pull it further, there's more energy, but the period does not change. In other words, if you make x bigger, if you make a bigger, x is the specific you know location how far you are from zero. So right now, if you pull it to this location a, that's your x for the starting spot, that's your displacement for the starting spot. And you can make that bigger. Wouldn't change the period. Pendulum, very similar equation. It looks almost identical, but look carefully. Okay, T once again, like if I pull a pendulum back over here, and, and a simple pendulum, and by simple pendulum we mean a really small mass, and we think of it as a point mass on the end of a string, and, it, um, and if you pull it back, and we, we, you're going to apply this to like even uh, playground swings like little kids and we're going to approximate them as a mass on the end of a string um, and they're going to approximate a simple pendulum. It'll, you'll get good results with that as well. Anything that swings back and forth. They can use these for clocks. Even this one up here, they can use for you know, they can use that for a clock. In fact, in some old clocks that, uh, or watches, wrist watches, there's little springs in there. Not a spring quite like this, but springs that can keep time because they make things bounce back and forth regularly. Once again, Grandmother clock, grandfather clock, you can use this for a clock. So you pull this back, and you let it; it'll swing back and out and back. Once it gets back to that same spot again, that's the cycle. That's the time for one complete cycle, all the way out, all the way back. Okay, don't just measure from this spot to this spot. That's half the cycle, half the period. Now the period of a pendulum is equal to two pi times the square root of l over g, where l is the length of the pendulum, not the length of the string. So be careful. Usually it's close to the length of the string, but it's the length from the top pivot point to the middle of the mass. Very important. I could ask you about that. From the pivot point to the middle of the mass. It's not technically the length of the string. A lot of books will say it's the length of the string. Well, no, it's close, but it's usually a little bit longer than the string itself. It's the middle of the mass. So keep that in mind. Divided by, so it's the square root of L, length of the pendulum, divided by g, which is our 9.8 on Earth. If you go to the moon, it's like 1.6. So it's whatever planet you're on, we're on the Earth, 99.99% of the time. Well, 100% of the time for us. So uh, what's interesting about this is now the mass doesn't matter. For, for the mass on the spring, the mass is a factor. Here, it doesn't really matter what our mass is. Different masses won't get the same result. And the angle that you pull it back doesn't matter, kind of like the amplitude and the mass on the, on the spring. Uh, unless you pull it back really crazy and it, just, it gets un, unstable. Don't pull it back too far if you do this lab. Pull it back a, a small angle. So this works well for a small angle and for a small mass. This equation works really well to keep time. All right, so let's try some problems now. What force constant is necessary to produce a period of that many seconds for a 0 .010 kilogram mass on a spring? So literally asking for the equation for the mass on a spring. So it's just a, a plug-in. So we'll start off. T equals 2 pi times the square root of m over k. That's 2 pi there. That's a, that's a pi symbol. Let me see if I can erase that. 2 pi. All right. Just plug in. I'm looking for, oh, no, we know the period. The period's, so we got to, you, I'll plug in first. 
You could have rearranged the equation. That's really the more professional way to do it. I'm just going to plug in what I know. I know the, whoops, that's not a parenthesis. It should be a square root. Square root of m, make sure it's kilograms, point zero one zero. A lot of times it'll come out and it'll, it'll give it to you in grams, so make sure uh, we're in kilograms already, so that was good. Divided by, oh, looking for k. So, once again, you could have rearranged this equation before you plug the numbers in. That's a very good way to do things. I just did it this way right now. So what I would do is I would take the 0 0.500, divide by 2 pi, divide by 2 and divide by pi, and I get, uh, I'm going to come up this way. So divide both sides by 2 pi, and you end up with um, 0 0.0796. 0 0.0796 equals the square root of 0 0.0150, divided by k. So I divided both sides by 2 pi, you know, which is like 6.28. Divided both sides by 6.28. Now I'm going to square both sides because I need to get rid of that square root. I square both sides and I get 6.34 6.34 times 10 to the negative third equals 0 0.0150 over k. Because the, if I square the square root, it gets rid of the square root. That's why, that's why I squared it. Then you can do a swap. You can swap out the 6.43 for the k. All right, they can change locations. In other words, you multiply both sides by k. The k will go to the left. And then divide both sides by 6.34. So it's like a swap. You get k equals 0 0.0150 divided by the 6.34 times 10 to the negative third, and then you just have to divide that to get your k value, your spring constant. They call it the spring constant. That is 2.4 newtons per meter. You, it's standard units. If you started with standard units, and, and did we double check that before we started? I think we did. Seconds are good. Kilograms are good. We didn't mention that at the beginning. So yeah, that is our spring force constant, spring constant, for that particular spring. All right. Now, here's a good exercise. It says if the spring constant of a simple harmonic oscillator, once again, simple harmonic oscillator is something that's very repetitive, cyclical, can be graphed as a sine wave curve or cosine wave curve. They're the same type of curve. It's a wave. By what? Okay, if we triple that. So they're just asking us to look at this in a general statement. So you look at, let's look at the equation. So if we have two t equals 2 pi times the square root of, we're talking about spring, m over k. All right, so that's t1. That's our initial. So here we go, t2. So the period, here's what happens. If we, it says we have to change something. If we triple the spring constant, so we have m over, uh, let me just do this. Let me do this. Whoops, let me do Something different here. Oh, sorry. Over 3. Because what we're doing is we're manipulating, we're tripling the spring constant. 3K. All right. So let me explain this to you. So how does T2 is different than T1? But what's the same as the 2, the pi, the m, the k? But this is 3K. I got to take. So if k over here was like 5. This would be 3 times 5 is 15. But I'm doing it in generic form right now. Because all I really need to do to solve a problem like this with these multipliers is forget about all the red. I mean, don't completely forget about it, but just look at the concentrate on the blue and factor that out. Factor out the blue. And if you factor out the blue here, the change, that was the change. All right. Bottom line is if I, and I'll do this in blue, mathematically, that's like taking, I'll explain this. Okay, so I took that out, and then you have 2 pi times the square root of m over k. All right, so this is a valid mathematical factor. In other words, this 3 right here is like having a 1 over a 3, 
It's like having a 1 over a 3. I can always put that, I can always put a 1 in numerator. So I could have, like, I, I'm thinking there was a 1 there in front of the M. So I just put a 1 there in front of the M. And that's all under the square root symbol. So what I simply just did is I can, when it's all multiplication like that, I can pull that factor out and put it way in the front. Because there's no addition here. That's a legal mathematical move. I separate that blue, which was the change of the tripling of the spring constant, pull it way out the front here. But I can't just put a zero up here above the three. I gotta have something above the three as a placeholder. So you put a one in there because that doesn't change the equation. But then all of this other expression here, or factor, is what it started with. In other words, to complete the problem here, right, t2 equals the square root of one-third times t1. All right? Now, that's the period, though. So the period of the new oscillator, and that's not really in standard form. You could put that in decimal form, or you could put it in standard radical form, which would be, what, the square root of 3 over 3. But I will take this as an answer. In the back of the book, if they said, okay, what is the factor for the comparison of the periods, T2 is that factor times T1. So again, mathematically, you could put that in decimal form. You can find the square root of one-third, square root of 0.333, whatever the square root of 0.33 is. It gives you another decimal number. But they want the, uh, the factor change in frequency. Well, frequency is just one over the period. So you can just flip it. In other words, the frequency number two the second frequency is just going to be the square root of 3 over 1 times frequency 1. Because frequencies and periods are always flipped. So all I got to do is flip the factor here to get the answer that they're looking for. The new frequency, frequency 2, is this factor times frequency 1. It's simply the square root of 3. You wouldn't, need to say, you wouldn't even need to say square root of 3 over 1 because the 1, when you divide by 1, it's just 3. So the factor multiplier is square root of 3. And a square root of 3 is like 1 point something. I don't know, 1.7 maybe? Whatever it is. You can put it in decimal form. Or you can leave it like this. The, you know, the, uh, the second frequency is that many times bigger than the first frequency. It's a bigger number. The period is a smaller number. Period number 2 is smaller. If you do the math there, it's a smaller number. But this is what they're looking for. The factor multiplier. Compare those. By what factor does the frequency change? Well, the factor is that square root of 3 over 1. That number, that blue number in parentheses is what they're looking for there. And I would take this for full credit. Okay, that's a little deep mathematical. And now we have a pendulum, a simple pendulum. Cuckoo clock uh, with a pendulum. We're assuming it's a simple pendulum. It's, well, it says to assume it's a simple pendulum. The pendulum is 5.00 centimeters long. That's pretty short, but we're going to go with that. Watch out, that's centimeters. we got to convert that to meters. And then the 68 grams, we don't want grams, but mass doesn't matter anyway. But if it did, we got to be, pay attention to that. We're going to plug in T equals 2 pi times the square root of L over G. So let's practice 2 pi. So we're assuming that, that length they gave us is to the center of mass of the heavy weight at the bottom of that pendulum, but the length is 0 0.05 meters. Move the decimal two places to convert from centimeters to meters. And I could, I could really have three sig figs there. Divided by 9.8. All right, we're not dividing by the mass. That's a mistake that's easily made. The mass doesn't matter for a single, uh, simple pendulum. So the first thing you would do is divide the 0 0.050 by the 9.8. Then you would take the square root of that and multiply by 2 pi. I did all that. I'm pretty sure if you have a calculator, it's pretty straightforward. Okay, 0 0.050 divided by 9.8 first. Take the square root of that answer and multiply by 2 pi. You end up with 0 0.45 seconds. So when you're doing a test or homework, that's all the work I need to see. You, you know. So actually, all I would need to see is this. In this case, it's just a sing, single step problem. You draw this and then give the answer. Show me your work. This is the best. You know, the original equation, the equation with the numbers plugged in, and then your answer. Good enough. Especially with these that are pretty straightforward. 
All right, number 10, by what factor oh, does the period change if the length of this pendulum is tripled? So, or any pendulum. So it's kind of like that last problem. All right, t equals 2 pi times the square root of L over G. Call that t1. Now t2, what are we changing? Just the length? Okay, so we're going to change the length. 2 pi times the square root of... And once again, I'll use a different color here to highlight this. And we're going to triple the length. Now that's in a numerator this time. So that's the change. But I'm going to, that's going to be three times the original length, L. And G doesn't change. So T2, all it has is an extra three in there. So all you got to do is look at that three. You got to concentrate on that. Everything else is the same. Once again, the first length was five centimeters. This length now is 15 centimeters if you had actual numbers. But we're not going to, we don't need the numbers. You're just going to pull that factor out. With factors, the rules for factoring in math, all right, is you can pull that out and bring it all the way in the front. If there's no addition. So you get, basically, you get the square root of 3. All right. You could say square root of 3 over 1, but you don't need to say over 1. If it's 1 over it, you got to, like in the previous problem, you, you need you need to put that one in there, but here, because it needs you can't put a zero in the numerator. But here, it's three over one is three. So then it's two pi times the square root of L over G. So all that red is all the original for T1. The only thing that's different in the second equation is the square root of three. So in other words, T2 is equal to the square root of three times T1. It's root 3, which you could put in decimal, or, yeah, decimal form. I'm not sure what the decimal is right now. Once again, it's like one point, I think 7, like I said before. Okay, times T1. All right, so the factor is, okay, by what factor? It's root 3. Root 3 is the factor. But you can just write it like this. That's a good way to put it. T2 is, a, is bigger. The period is bigger for that pendulum doesn't ask you about frequency. The other one had, like, now, if you ask you for the frequency, the frequency would be one over that. It'd be the square root of one-third. So, we well, didn't have to do that. The other problem, you had to do the frequency. This one's just period. Now, part B here in this problem, that was part A. Part B, what if you triple the mass? Well, kind of a trick question. No change in period. No change. No change in the period. The only thing that changes the period is how long the pendulum is and the gravity constant for the planet you're on, which on Earth is never going to change. But if it said, what if you go to the moon where gravity is different, you'd have to factor that in then, like uh, the previous problem, or like, you know, put that blue factor in there and factor it out. Okay, last thing here on these notes, intensity. Uh, intensity, I is power over area. I'm going to use an example with a laser. They do laser surgery uh, for correcting vision, and cataract surgery, and other things. They do, they do a lot of other types of surgeries, lasers as well, for cutting and destroying cancers and things like that. But um, just a general definition is power over area. But I have the laser example. I think in the, in the uh, homework, I think the examples with an ultrasound. They try to do a lot of medical examples, which is good because a lot of you are biology majors. But this one, you got to read it carefully. Uh, calculate the intensity. We need the power over the area. Now, you can write this down if you don't remember this from uh, uh, Physics 201. Power, power is energy over time. So that's got to be used here. In fact, that's probably the first step here. You can you can combine everything. I like to keep things separate. For example, in this case, I know the power here is the energy over the time. The energy is 452 joules. And the time is, make sure you're in seconds. If it was minutes, like three minutes, you got to convert that into seconds. But it's in seconds already, 3.80 seconds, because we want joules and seconds. So the power here is pretty straightforward. 
452 joules per second, which is, for 3.80 uh, 3 seconds, 119, 119 joules per second, or what we call a watt. Watts, that's the power. So the intensity, the intensity is that power, is the power over the area. And the area here, uh, the power is 119. The area is pi r squared. The area for a circle, the area for a circle is pi r squared. I could do that calculation over there. I can just write it down here. It's going to be pi times the radius squared. But now be really, really careful. You need to you need to radius its diameter first of all. Okay, if the diameter is two point three four, if the diameter is two point three four millimeters, it's millimeters. That means the radius is one point one seven millimeters. But I want meters. That's zero point zero zero one one seven meters. So from millimeters to meters, it's three decimal places. Centimeters to meters, it's two places. But I believe that's correct. That's 0 0.00117 squared. And you got to remember to square that. Just square. You don't want to square everything, though. So you, if you want to be safe, you do pi times that 0 .00, 0 0.00117 squared ahead of time, and then divide that into 119. So you got to push all the right buttons on your calculator. And when you do all that, you get 1.3 times 10 to the 7th. 1.3 times 10 to the seventh, and that's watts per meter squared. I didn't mention that before. I can go back up there, but because we had to convert to meters for our area, and then when you do pi times r squared, you're, when your r is in meters, that's meter squared for your area. That's that's your standard unit for area. And then of course we had watts. The joules per second was a watt. But I have it up here. Intensity is in watts per meter squared. And usually we just say capital W for watts. I almost always spell out watts because I don't want you to confuse that with work, capital W. So, or put joules per second, but that's um, sometimes gets confusing as well. Anyways, that's the intensity of this particular burst of laser light, whatever it's being used for. And... That's it for then the application of simple harmonic motion to two of the most basic types of simple harmonic oscillating systems, the mass on a spring and the simple pendulum and related ideas like intensity, which will then connect us into the next unit on the physics of hearing and sound.